All right. All right. The record is on. Um, I forgot to share one item in my previous class, so I just remember to do it now. Um, so this may be something that you'll be interested in. It's next Friday. I know, you know those of you don't want to eat on Friday. But this, this is on next Friday. It is uh, Intel is going to be on campus. Um, and they will start to talk about internship opportunities for community college students. So this is not a generic, no, it's not a generic uh, internship, you know, for anything. It is specifically tailored for community college students. And on top of that, okay, this is not for any type of department or any division. This one is tailor-made for us, okay. Um, so let me just scroll down here. Oh, that's it. Um, it's for uh, majors in accounting, business, computer science, marketing. They should, there should be a comma here. Okay, there's no such thing as computer science marketing. It is an oxymoron. <laughs> as much as Steve Jobs is a, disagrees, it is an oxymoron. Uh, management and technical communication. So in other words, if you think about Intel, okay, and you look at all those you know, subject areas or majors, which one do you think of the most? Computer science. Okay, never mind, you know, I actually think marketing comes first, but, you know, close enough. So if you are available next Friday from 1 to 2 o'clock, um, it's in this particular classroom, okay, um, and people from Intel will be here, okay, it's not going to be one of us, you know, from here, from the community college, actually presenting, it will be Intel people presenting. If you have questions, bring your questions. Uh, you might want to do some research ahead of time, you know, just to find out you know, what they do and stuff like that. Um, but if you're interested in an internship, you know, this would be a good opportunity to talk to the people you know, who have the connections. Yep. What kind of internship? Um, you have to be here on Friday because I don't know. Okay. <laughs> so any questions about this one? Any questions? Okay. Now I know the majority, if not all of you, are going for a transfer degree and you want to go to a four-year university. So you might think that you don't need an internship or an internship does not help. What do you think? Depends what university you're going to. Okay, but after university, where do you go? Out of school, but, but by then you should already. But why would, is internship useful? Yes. How is it useful? Because they, uh, really credible sources that the people higher up look at when they select you for whatever private school you get to, you want to go to. So. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Work experience. Work experience, yes. Work experience is important. Not so much when you're applying to a four-year university, but eventually, I'm hoping that everyone is going to get a job, okay? So when you try to get your land your first job, what are you going to write on your resume? That is the question. Now I know you have taken up you know other jobs like you know waiting at a restaurant or working for you know a fast food place. You know we all do that, okay? But if you put that on your resume and you're applying for a computer science or computer <laughs> engineering job, it may not be that helpful. On the other hand, if you can say that I am an intern at Intel. And if you know people well enough at Intel and they are willing to write you a reference, that carries a lot of weight. Okay? So it's not for right now, it's not for transferring to a four-year university, it's for eventually when you want to find a full-time job in the field of computer science or something related, that can come in handy. Okay? So that's all I'm gonna say. Okay, if you can make it, go ahead. You're highly recommended to go to this one. Um, and I think it really applies to this class. All right, so I'm gonna close this and continue with our discussion. This is 300. We're not gonna talk about pre and post conditions unless you guys want to. Instead, we'll, we'll finish up the story of um, registers. Do you guys still remember registers? Mm. And it relates to the flip-flops. And these flip-flops relate to SR latches, latches. And a SR latch is made out of two NAND gates. And NAND gates can be, can be made out of transistors. Okay? So the whole point is 
everything translates all the way down to transistors. You know? All right, so I'm not going to put any more time into this one. And instead, what I'll do is I'm going to look for my tax processor V2, version 2. And I think this semester, we are looking forward to a version 3 of this processor. But version 2 is good enough to show you the concepts already. Okay, So I, what I want to do is to show you the concept. Um, this is a file that you can download. Okay, Not click, but right click. Right click, save it as a link. Um, it will have an extension of CIRC. So what do we do about this file? How do we open it? It's logic sim. Okay. So I'll just go ahead and download it into my temp folder. Go to one uh, window of command line from here. Fire up logic sim. And by the way, you can also specify the file that you are trying to open in logic sim. That works too. Um, it's called tax processor v2. Not a meat processor processor, but a computer processor processor. There, there we go. So we now have a picture of what is inside the processor. This is RAM, you know, so this part is actually outside of the processor. But this part here, everything to the left hand side are stuff components that are inside the processor. This one is not entirely done, so I think this semester we can just you know, kind of finish this up also. All right, so we'll go ahead and zoom in to you know, several components. The first component that I want to point out is the ALU. The ALU stands for A is arithmetic, L is logic, and then U is just unit. Okay. In other words, most of the work is done by this component. The ALU is the one that is doing most of the work. Addition, subtraction, comparing, multiplication, division, you know, any actual computation is done here. But that is, you can see, it's not really taking up that much space of a processor because the processor needs something else. The ALU itself, for one thing, it cannot store anything. Okay, it can compute, but what do you do with the result of the ALU? It, it cannot store anything. So what you do is you have a bank of registers. Not just one, but you have a bank, like several registers. And that becomes collectively just known as, quote unquote, the registers in this picture. Are we doing OK so far with the expl explanation? Registers are great because they are fast. They can keep up with the ALU. Um, they're on the same processor die, but they have one problem. There are very few of them. Okay? The Intel processor, like what we talked about on Tuesday, we are you know, the Intel architecture is locked to only use eight registers because of historical reasons. Because we don't want to lose backward compatibility, and that's why there are only eight registers. But even if you can use as many registers as possible, there will still be a limit because these things all have to be on die on the same die as the processor, and there's just, no, there's just not enough room to fit 16 gigs of RAM <coughs> on the same die. Okay? Physically, it's not possible. So that means all of these things will have to talk to the memory. That's why you see there are lines connecting these components back to the RAM module. Are we still doing OK so far with this picture? Okay, let's take a look at all the components that we have at this point. We got the actual thing that can do the computation. We can magnify and see what's inside later on. We got registers that are really fast. They can store, they can also provide your know, values for the AL to work, ALU to work on. And we also have a way to connect back to the memory so that you know, we have 16 gigs here to store results and stuff like that. We're missing one really important part. What about the instructions? According to the design of, according to the von Neumann, or the von Neumann architecture, where do we store instructions? How do we tell the computer what to do next? Memory. Hmm? Memory. memory. Say memory, where you store your data. Okay. 
Okay? So that part is kind of missing. And then we also have um, a few other items here. Um, we have, this is called the instruction register. Last year, we never really got around to you know, specifying the instructions, but I think this year we'll be able to do that. Um, we have, this is called a MUX, well, I'll explain what a MUX is. This is an address register. This is a program counter. Now the program counter is very, very important because it shows you what is the address of the next instruction that the processor needs to execute. All right, so that's the overview of the uh, entire processor. Of all the things that we have talked about, I think you know the ALU will be the one that I should look at first because we already know most of the components inside the ALU. So we'll go ahead and take a look at inside the ALU. So this is inside the ALU. We have a carry in coming in. We have two operands, okay, in zero and in one are in this case they're both eight bits and they feed into all of these items here. I'll explain what a MUX is later. What do you think this one is? If you know this, what this is, you're going to go like, but why did we have to do that homework? Adder. It's an adder. <laughs> it is an adder. Um, you have two numbers coming in from the left hand side. You have a carry in coming in from the top. The carry out is not even utilized you know, at this point. And then the output of the carry is going into a MUX. Once again, I'll explain what a MUX is later on. What about the second one? What do you think it is? It's a subtractor, exactly. But this is not a subtractor where you can double click in and it will expand and show you what is inside. This is just a unit that is known as a subtractor. It doesn't show you the components inside the subtractor. So it's not going to be helpful for your current homework assignment. <coughs> Okay. Other than you can use it to cross check your own design. Because what you can do is you can um, put your put an actual subtractor into your design, feed the six signals into a real actual subtractor, take the output of the real actual free bit subtractor, compare to your output. So you can spot you know, problems you know, relatively quickly. Which means we could also use the uh, addition version for that as well. Could have. In hindsight. Right, in hindsight. And there are ways to um, check automatically increment a counter. So that way, you know, you can um, check everything within the 64 combinations that, we, that you have to check. What about this one? What does it look like to you? It says minus X. It says minus X. So what do you think it is? It's negating. Yep. Yep. And what do you think this one and this one would do? Yep. One would do a right shift. The other one does a left shift. So these are the basic mechanisms inside ALUs. They do all the work. Okay. All the work, all the computation will be done by this. But tag early, you said about comparison. I don't see anything that is doing comparison here. What do you think? Inside the modules. The subtractor. The subtractor is also responsible to do comparison. In fact, later on, not today, but later on when we look at instructions, the subtraction instruction is the same as the comparison instruction with only the one difference. The subtraction instruction stores the result where the comparison instruction does not store the result. But it goes through exactly the same motion. Okay? So we'll talk about that later. Now the mystery item is what is a MUX, okay? Well, first of all, a MUX is, a, is an abbreviation of multiplexer, okay? And by looking at the input into the MUX and also the output of the MUX and also some of the other lines, I'll let you guys try to figure out what it does, okay? All right, so several things. First of all, this, is the, this line here is the output of the adder. This is the output of the subtractor. This is the output of the negator, and so on. This line here, because it connects to a pin that is square, is it an input or is it an output from the MUX's perspective? Output. It's an input. It would 
from the perspective of the class. In other words, I specified 0, 0, 0 to go into this port of the box. Okay? How many inputs are there to the box on the left hand side? Five. Well, there are five are used, okay, but if you also count the dots, how many uh, inputs? Eight. There are eight of them, okay? So if there are eight inputs, there's one output, what do you think this is doing? Exactly, it is selecting which input goes to the output. So imagine this you know, as having eight rails going into a station. It is selecting which rail actually connects to the outgoing rail. Except it's like a three-bit selector. It is a selector, exactly. That's what it is. It's a selector. And this one here is called ALU out N. It's output enabled. Okay, it simply means you know, are we driving the output pins or not? It's not important at this point. So this is a basic architecture of an ALU. All the computations happen at exactly the same time, but you get to choose the result of which one you get to send out. Yep. So why do we have a splitter on, on the left? Why do we have a splitter? A splitter. Yeah. Oh, you mean this guy here? Yeah. <laughs> um, because when you're shifting, you have eight bits, right? How many bits can you shift when your numbers are all eight bit numbers? You can only shift up to how many times? Eight times. Okay, well, you, eight times you, it, it all becomes zeros, right? So that's why there's a splitter here, because this pin can only have three bits. And you cannot feed eight bits into here. So that's why I need to split and ignore five bits out of eight and only feed three into here and only three into here. That's the only reason why this is split. But good, good observation okay, to, to spot that split. Okay. Any other questions about the ALU? Okay. What if you want to learn more about the multiplexer? <coughs> Sorry. Google it. Google it. Google is one way to do it. Um, I don't think you bring up the internals of it, but the help of Logisim is actually surprisingly good. So what you do is you look it up, it's called a multiplexer, so it's in the plexer <coughs> library. And inside here you just look at multiplexer, and it gives you a really good explanation of what it is, and what are the various attributes of it. Alright, are there any questions at this point about what is, the, what is a multiplexer and what an ALU does? Questions? All right. What about the register bank? So we'll take a look at the register bank. So we go back to the main design here, and then we go to the register bank. The first thing we want to do is to look at what are the input in or the output, what, what is the interface to the register bank? So let's take a look at this one here. It looks, a, it looks like a big mess, but when we click on the wire, it can show us you know, how things are connected. And also there are names too. These names are you know, particularly useful too. All right, so it has one, two, it has two output selection. Um, I think I misnamed one of them. They should, right, this is input selection, this is output selection, so let me change the name first. All right, this is a register bank. The purpose of a register bank, one main purpose, is to supply values to the ALU, so the ALU can compute stuff, but it's also responsible to store the result coming back from the ALU. So what do you expect, you know, what do you think has to be connected? It doesn't matter how, but it has to be connected in what way to which component that is already here in the design. It has to connect to the ALU, because this thing is supposed to supply the values to be computed. But it also has to connect to the ALU because it also stores the values after the computation. Are we doing okay so far? So there are supposed to be three paths at least 
from the register bank to the ALQ. So let's track down those wires. This is one wire, okay? It's also connected elsewhere, but that's not the important part. This wire goes to one particular input of the ALU. Here's another wire. It goes to the other input to the ALU. So the output from the register bank goes to the input of the ALU because we want to be able to specify, hey, register one, I want, and register four, I want you guys to supply the values to the ALU so that we can add these two numbers. ALU will do the computation, come up with a sum. The question is, oh, what do we do with the sum? Let's store it back into the register. That wire is this one. So this wire goes back to the register bank so that we can store the result after a compute computation back into one of the registers. So are we doing okay so far as far as the pathways are concerned between, a re between the register bank and the ALU? Is that okay? Don't worry about the output enable, the input enable, and stuff like that. We just focus on the big picture at this point. So now the next question is, what does it look like inside the register bank? <coughs> Let's go take a quick look at inside the register bank. Okay. First of all, it has a whole bunch of stuff like this. What do you think, well, you can already tell from the screen, what is one of these things? It is a register. It is a register. And what do, a, what, what, do, what do we do with registers? What can they do? They're basically big flip-flops, okay? So what do we do with flip-flops? We can store values, right? And we can retrieve values. They're basically quote-unquote variables, but they're really fast. They can keep up with the operations of the AMU. What do you do when you want to learn more about registers, specifically inside the context of LogiSim? Go to help. Yep, you say help, library, reference. Then you go to memory library, because uh, registers is a part of memory. Click on register, and it will tell you, you know, a lot, the most things about the register, okay? And let's take a look at one register here. And we'll zoom in because I want to talk about the interface to one register. You know, what kind of input does it have? What kind of output does it have? Okay, this is one port. It's called data. This is the D port. It's the same as the D or the data input to a D flip-flop. In other words, these wires, okay, there are eight of those you know, combined into one here. But these wires basically are used to specify the new value that you want to store into a register. These are input pins from the perspective of a register. The equivalent to the D pin in a D flip-flop. It's just that there's a bunch of them. Can we do okay so far with that? Well, if these are the inputs, where are the outputs? What do you think? It, it even uses the same notation. Q. Q is the output. So Q is the output. Whether it really is outputting or not depends on whether um, the output enable is selected. You can have a separate control for output enable or maybe you don't need to do that. But basically that's the output of the register, which is the same thing as either pin X in the D flip-flop design or the Q of the D flip-flop design. Okay? Are there any questions about D, which is the input, and Q, which is the output of a register. Questions? What about this guy here? When you hover over it, it tells you it is a clear pin, which means if it is a one, it will reset the register to zero. Why would I want to have something like that? Store new data. Sorry? Store new data. Store new data? There's a, there are two more pins responsible to store that new data, okay? Why would I want to have a mechanism to zero all the registers back to a initial state, a known initial state? 
starting up a processor. Okay, when you power up electronics, what happens to the state of the random. transistors? It's all random. Okay, certain registers <coughs> maybe it's okay to have it random, but many registers you wanted to start with a known value. Now zero is a good known value to begin with. So that's why we have this pin. When this pin is asserted, the register, the, all the bits stored in the register, they all go to zero. Isn't that also used when you reset the, reset the register? The same thing? What do you mean by resetting a register? After the information has been retrieved, it's reset? Nope. When you re uh, there's no such thing as quote unquote retrieving the data from the register. The a register is always outputting its content. So you don't need any. You, you don't need to do anything special to to get the value of a register. Okay. What about if you're writing? Wouldn't you need to reset it first before? Uh, you don't need to reset. You just overwrite it. You overwrite it. You just overwrite it. Okay. It because it's remember it's based on the design of a D flip flop. Yeah. So with with a D flip flop, when you want to store a new value, you just present the new value mm -hmm. in the D pin, and then you have a rising clock edge, the you know, rising edge of the clock, and then it will store the new value. It will overwrite the old value automatically. So there's no need to reset it first. Okay. Okay. What about this pin here? It says uh, clock. Oh, have we talked about mm -hmm. clock, CLK, have we talked about D flip flops? Exactly. So this one is also using the rising edge polarity, which means when there's a rising edge on this pin, then whatever you present here in the data, in the data input pin, will overwrite the content of the register. What about this blue wire here? What do you think that one is going to do? Okay, before we talk about the blue wire, let's zoom out a little bit. Then you will probably figure out why we need a blue wire. Let's look at the data pin and click on it. I, when I click on a wire, it will highlight the entire wire. It doesn't matter where it goes. Okay. Look at this. So the data pin is connected to all of the registers. In other words, when we have a new bit pattern specified in the data bus, it will be presented to every single register in the register bank. What is the likelihood that I want to update all the registers to exactly the same value? Very slim, okay? Maybe occasionally we want to do something like that, but most of the time we don't want to do that. Because if that's what we want to do all the time, we only need one register. The whole idea of having multiple register is for each register to store its own value. Okay, so if the input pin is going to all of the registers, what about the clock pin? Maybe the clock pin goes into different parts. Let's take a look at the clock pin. This is the clock pin. They all go to the one single clock. Okay, so we have a problem now because we have all the data pins going into all the, we have the, the data bus goes to all the registers. The clock pin goes to all the registers. So what is going to control which register is going to be updated? The enable pin, which is not in our D flip flop design. So when we zoom in again and we look at the blue wire, it says enable. When zero, clock trigger are ineffective. That's what it says. Okay. So this is basically a gate to basically say, okay, if this pin is a low, I am going to ignore everything. I will ignore everything in the D input pin. I will ignore everything on the clock pin. I'm just not going to do anything. But when this pin is high, then the register pays attention to the other pins. Are we doing okay so far? So now the next question is, how do we specify that only one register is paying attention and not multiple registers? Do an AND gate. Well, With it's the a. Clock and the, uh, on. It's this little guy here. Okay, it looks like a trapezoid. It says right here D E C D. Okay, that's rather cryptic. What do you think is D E C D? Sorry. It's called a decoder. Okay, it's a decoder. Okay. So what I'll do next is to let you guys figure out, you know, exactly, you know, what it does. 
Um, how many pins are coming out of the, the base of the trapezoid? Eight. Eight, okay. And two to the power of three is eight. Do you see some other interface or some other port of D, E, C, D, the decoder, connecting to a three-bit pin? The select, exactly. So what do you think this, this number is going to do? Exactly, it selects which output pin is going to be asserted. So in this particular case, it will be bit two, right? Because zero, one, zero in base two is specifying two as a value. 0, 1, 2. So this should be the one that is going to have a high value. But this is the register that is that is actually addressing. Are we kind of doing okay so far with the operation? You have a question? Yep. Yeah, we'll, we'll the, the, the three-bit number. Ah, that's a very good question. In this particular picture, this is a input pin, right? That's just a in, that's an input pin because it has square corners. If it if it has rounded corners, it's an output pin. This is just an input pin. In other words, this picture doesn't tell you who is going to uh, change those you know, values. It's simply saying, okay, somebody has to specify these values. I know what to do with them, but I don't know who is going to specify those particular values. So let's zoom out one level and see whether we can see who is changing those pins. That's a very good question because when you zoom it out one level, those pins are corresponding to this, which is still input pins. It doesn't connect to anywhere else. Is that okay? So ultimately, what do you think is missing in this process of design? That's a really kind of hard question to answer, but I will let you guys kind of at least give it a try. What is missing? Look at, okay, I'll, I'll Zoom out even one more, two more levels, and you will see the, uh, the issue with this. We don't need to read the text. Just kind of look at all the pins in this thing. How many pins are just, you know, there are pins, but nobody is specifying those values. We got this, 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 and so on. So we have a lot of stuff that are pins where in the simulation, I can specify the value, but they are not automated in any way. This cannot be a standalone processor that can execute instructions. Okay? It's kind of like a piano. Look at this picture like a piano. Every key makes a sound. By itself, it is functional. Okay? You click on a certain pin, the ALU will do some calculation and it will spill out the sum instead of the difference of the numbers. Okay? That works. You set certain pins, the register bank will output one the value of one of the registers. You flip some other pins, one of the registers in the register, one of the registers in the register bank will store a value going into the register bank. That works by itself. Okay? Once again, we have keys on the piano. What is missing? The play. We're missing the scores. Okay? Which keys? Should I play at the same time? And then followed by which other keys, and then followed by which other keys. That's what, what's missing. So the instructions. Well, the instructions eventually will lead to that, but the instructions are not exactly that. The instructions are more like macros. In other words, one single instruction is kind of like playing a particular tune. And then in that tune, it has multiple chords, and you have to kind of da -da -da -da, you know, do several things. So each instruction is kind of like that. It, it's basically specifying a particular um, segment of a tune. So by specifying consecutive instructions, now you have a piece of music where you can connect the end result of one instruction to the beginning of the next instruction, and so on. But that's basically what we're missing. I'll give you one more analogy. And this one will be very helpful, because at some point, we're going to have a, you know, uh, homework assignment that relates to this. I'll show you this picture. Because the piano is a little bit more complicated, but I think this would be a good uh, analogy. So let me go to the browser. I think I just, oh, I just got past it. There we go. There we go. 
I'll look at the music box. Nice store, apparently. Probably the little box. Probably not something that I can afford. Okay, that seems to be a good picture. Let's just look at the picture. Not big enough, but that's okay. I can zoom in. And we are now looking at a music box in a computer science class. Yeah, yeah don't tell the music teachers. They won't, they won't like it. You're supposed to teach computers. What are you doing with a music box? Okay, look at these things. Each one plays a particular sound, right? A particular frequency. If you, if you take away the drum, Okay, and you use a pin, a screwdriver, or something, and you plug these wires, yep, they make sounds. That's just like tweaking the pins manually. And you say, hey, the register band does work. You can store a value into a particular register. That's good. Um, I can specify this and that as output registers, and the ALU can do the computation. You can do the sum of two particular values, and so on and so forth. And I can tweak something else, and the sum goes back to the register bank, and now it is stored. But that would be not using the drum at all, and just you know plucking these wires individually. <coughs> so what is missing? We're missing the drum. We're missing this thing here. What 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 happens when you have a drum in a music box, and it rotates? What 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 does it do? In a specified order a specified sequence. That is that's what's missing. So we need a conductor getting back to the processor picture. So what we need, yep, go ahead. Do you know there's a road um, somewhere in Arizona that has little bumps that you go over and it's gonna gonna start hearing music inside of your car like the vibrations? No way. Yeah. It's <laughs> <laughs> the same way. It's subject to the uh, capabilities of your shocks, but it's variable, yeah. If you have stiff suspension, you're going to hear it real well. <laughs> so if you have a, a Cadillac that has, you know, completely shot, you know, <laughs> like shocks, then you're you won't hear a single volume. thing. Yeah. You won't hear a single thing. You'll just hear... <laughs> <laughs> and then the engine goes up. <laughs> okay, so what we're missing... Okay, what are we talking about here? Okay, let's see if I can just flip flop between these two. Each one of these lines, or these, how do you call those, tines, I guess, okay, is a pin in our processor design. You can plug each one, you can plug them in a particular sequence manually, and then they will do stuff, okay? But who's going to do that inside the processor? You're not going to do that, right? So we're missing that drum mechanism to basically say, oh, turn this on, turn it off, and then turn this on again while that one is on, and so on. We're missing that component. That component, in return, connects to instructions. In other words, okay, this is kind of taking this analogy a little bit far, but you can look at each instruction as one segment of this drum. Not the entire drum, just one segment. And you can index by instruction. So by feeding the instruction into this particular mechanism, it will automatically switch to the segment that is needed. Play that particular segment, and then the next instruction will specify which segment to play next, and so on. That is called microcoding. Okay? That is currently missing in that particular processor. Are we doing okay so far with the overall view of the processor? Okay, if you don't understand what a MUX is, it's not really that big of a deal. You can look it up, you know, you can just test the circuit, you can find out. A decoder, exactly the same thing. But the big picture is something has to be tweaking and turning on and turning off stuff with this and that component. Are we still doing okay so far with that concept? Now, with a drum like this, it has a it's spring loaded. Well, it, it has a, a wind, it's, it, there's a wind up mechanism and it can rotate by itself. So, what do you think is the equivalent of that in a processor design? Something that can go automatically like this. In fact, that design is already in here, except it is 
kind of tucked away and is a little obscure. It's hard to see, but it's here. So what I'll do is I'm focusing on one particular section and see whether we can make sense out of it. This is, well, I think I can zoom, maybe that's it. Okay, that's the closest I can zoom in and still see the whole thing. It's the bottom portion, not the top portion, the bottom portion. So what do we see here? Let's identify the components first. The first thing is we can see a PC is a, um, is a register. Okay, it's just like all the other registers has the input going to the D port, the output is the Q port. We have enable, which is, um, enable is this pin here. This is the clock pin. This is the reset pin, which is which will turn it all into zero. And this is the output, okay? So same register as what we have seen before. But look at how this register is connected to the next, the other components. What does it connect to? What is the component that I'm pointing at right now? It's an adder, okay? And it seems to be a pretty stupid way to use an adder. What is it adding? One of the input is the output of the program counter, the register, and the other input is zero, the constant zero. So it's adding zero to the content <coughs> of the program counter. But wait, there's one more thing. What is this one here? That's the carry. The carry in into the adder, which is also added to the value. In other words, this is just adding one. Okay? It's adding one. Where is the output of this adder? What, where is it going to? It goes to a mux. It goes to the input of a mux. So I'm just highlighting highlighting the, uh, the connection here. So it goes to a mux, okay? And a mux is nothing more than a switch, right? So in this case, we have a two input, one output mux, and the selection is done by PC in cell or PC program counter input select, okay? This one bit is going to specify if it's a zero, it's coming in from the adder, if it is a one, it comes in through something else, which we're not too concerned about at this point. So don't worry about where the other line is connected to. But we know that this is a kind of like a loop, right? Because the output of the program counter goes into an adder. The adder in returns go back to the register. Are we doing a pseudo okay so far? If I have PC enabled turned on, and I give this a clock, a rising edge, what do you think is going to happen? It increments by one. And then clock drops from high to low, and it goes from low to high again. What does it do? It increments again. That's your mechanism of rotating the drum. Okay? All you need is now just a continuous transition going the clock line only has to go up, go down, go up again, go down again. Then you have this thing, can all, it can also increment. And then you can use it to index into, guess what? A ROM. This can connect to the address line of a ROM, and then the output of the ROM can now be used to control the other things, the other pins. So that's the general idea of a processor. Let's check out whether that auto increment thing works or not. So let's go ahead and start a new project, okay? Because I don't want to mess up the other one. And we'll just go ahead and design that circuit here. It's not hard. We go to memory, go to register, pick out the register. A bit is fine. The trigger is rising edge. You know, that's all good. We don't even need to give it a particular name because there's only one register here. We go to arithmetic, pick out a, an adder, Put it here. We can move it a little bit. Like that. Um, and then we have to specify two constants. It's up to you to decide which one is going to be zero and which one is going to be one. It's just that they have to add up to one. So we go to wiring to specify the constants. Uh, I'll, do, I'll do it the same way as in the processor design. So the carry input is a one, and then the actual number input is going to be a zero. 
So once again, I pick this out, but this time I have to specify an A bit zero like that. So this is resembling exactly the same thing in the design, in the processor design, just like that. Okay? And then we take the output of the adder, feed it back to the input of the register. Like that. We want to make sure that the uh, clear or the reset pin is grounded so we don't accidentally clear the content of, the reg of this register. So we just have a one bit zero connecting to that. Like that. Um, this is the enable pin. Let's just say that we want it to be on all the time. Okay, this is not the case inside the processor. But in this case, you know, I just want it to be on all the time. What is left is just the clock pin. Yep? Um, why did the uh, input to the adder have to be an 8 bit 0? Because that's a requirement. When you, when you have an 8 bit adder, it's expecting both inputs to have the same width, which is 8 bits. And that's what, if you try to give it something that's not 8 bit, it will give you an error. But not the carry. Not the carry. The carry is only one bit, because the the carry in is for um, doing multiple consecutive carries, so you can handle an integer where the width is more than the width of the adder itself. But I'm just abusing it, you know, in this case to add one. Okay. So what we're missing is just the clock pin, which is this pin here. It has to be going to something that goes up and down all the time. And guess what? We do have something like that that can go up and down by itself. By itself, it's called. Okay, I just dragged it from here. It's called clock. It's not very surprising, huh? So we now connect the clock to this thing here, and nothing happens. The register stays as zero. What is going on here? What? Where do you think I should go? Take a look. In the menus. What do you think? Okay, the, the property of the clock itself doesn't really do anything. It just says you know, high duration is one tick, low duration is one click. Um, that's for in very special occasions, you want it not to have a 50 50 percent duty cycle, which means the on off time would, be, would not be the same. In this case, they're the same. So it will stay off and stay on for exactly the same amount of time. So that's not going to do anything to help us here. You go to simulate. Okay. Can you see anything on the on this particular menu that can be related to what we're trying to do? The empty box next to tick enabled. Yes. <laughs> yeah. What is a tick? One clock cycle. Okay. So if we say tick once, it will go tick tick like that. Let's let's check it out. It's also control T. So it goes high, and you can see it is now one because it has just clocked in the value of one a zero plus one, and it has just clocked that back into the register. I'm just typing control T on the keyboard. It goes back to zero. Nothing happens because remember. Just like our edge sensitive D flip flop that we talked about the other day, this will only store a new value on a rising edge of the clock. So the fallen edge doesn't do a single thing. Okay, but if you think about it right now, what is the output of Q? Q is always outputting the current value of the register, which is one. And what is the output of the adder? It specifies the value of two because we have one plus one, so the upper value is two. In other words, if you click on this wire, it will show you a value of two in binary. Let's check it. Uh, okay, you have to do the simulation mode, but it does show you that the wire itself specifies zero, 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 one, zero, which is the value of two, which also means <coughs> the input to the register is already two. The only reason why the content of the register is one is because we have not clocked yet. Okay, there's no rising edge for that value of two to be stored in the register. 
Is that okay? All right. So instead of having me to type control T the whole time, I'm going to automate this. Okay. This is the nice thing about um, LogiSim. It, it, it does give you a mechanism to do that. The first thing is I want to check the tick frequency because if it's too fast, we cannot see it. So right now it is at one hertz. What is hertz? H-E-R-T-Z. It's the last name of a guy, but also known as once per second. Okay, very good. So that means you know the clock line will go up, and then after one second it will go down. After another second it will go up again. So the clock cycle is actually two seconds. Okay, it will take two seconds for a rising edge to happen again. Or at least you know, that's the way I interpret it. Maybe it would actually do one hertz. We'll, we'll find out. Okay, so now if I click this particular checkbox, which is text enabled, it will do it automatically. I don't have to do a single thing. So let's check it and see what happens. So it is, it's actually specifying, you know, one second high, one second low, one second high, one second low, well, the other way around. But it's a two second cycle. Each cycle takes two seconds. And you can see the value of the register keep changing, right? What if I were to change, uh, hook up the output of Q to the address line of some kind of memory? Then there'll be address, addressing a different byte per clock. And then what if the output of, the, of that particular memory module goes to the register select, you know, the ALU select in, blah, 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 blah. Now we have a mechanism to control the components inside the processor. So that's a big picture, okay? You know, it's just a big picture thing. Are we doing okay so far with this little design here? This is the basic mechanism to drive that drone. All right, so we'll keep this one running, and then we'll specify something else in this design. I'll specify a ROM you know, on the other side. A ROM is the abbreviation of what? Random. Access something access memory. That's RAM. <laughs> ROM is read only oh, ROM. Hmm? Say again. Read only. Read only memory. That is correct. It is not the female version of a RAM. <laughs> Some people may think that. It's also not another brand of Dodge. All right, so go to memory. And this time we pick out a ROM. So, and with the ROM, you can actually specify the content. You can you know, right click on it and then go to edit content. So, you know, you don't have to, I'm not gonna make this too fancy. So what we'll do is we'll just specify some kind of random values here. I will also change the ROM so it doesn't have that many you know, locations because this will take all day <coughs> if I were to fill up everything. Okay, one row is good enough. And that's it. And I'll just change this, you know, if I want the ROM to have exactly 16 locations, how would I change the address bus width? The address class dictates you know, the, uh, the number of locations in a ROM. So right now it is 8 bit wide, which means how many locations can I specify in the ROM. 2 to the power of 8 is 256. If I just want to deal with 16, how should I change the address bit width? <coughs> 2 to the power of 4 is 16, so that's what I will do. Okay, so we'll go ahead and change this address bit width to 4. Doesn't mean I have to change the D because that's you know, the width of each location. It can still be 8 bit. And now we can hook up the wires. And the first thing we'll see is it's going to complain. Bing! Complaints. Now when it complains, it tells you what, is, what it is complaining about and it will also give you suggestions of how to fix it. Right now it says incompatible width. Because the address bus input of the ROM is specifying four bits, but my register and also my adder 
on a bit. So how do I fix this problem? You go back to the register and say, nope, I don't need a bits, just need four. You go to the adder, same thing. Just specify this is a four bit adder. Now everything is almost good again, except for the constant, because the constant is the same thing. It also has a width. So now we have to specify zero using only four bits. And now everything is good. Are we still doing okay so far with this design? And many of you are thinking, well, this is not exciting. We're just looking at something taking. Again, you can hardly see anything that is particularly you know, uh, exciting. Let's hook this up to something that's a little bit more exciting. And to do that, we'll go to input output. Okay. Now we are talking. We are talking, right? We, we can specify buttons, joystick, keyboard, LED, la 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 la. Um, seven that's seven ahead. segment display. Seven segment display. Let's that, check that's it a, out. That's a fun one. And now I'm going to upset uh, people teaching electronics. Okay, so here's my seven segment display. You can hardly see the segments. Um, it has eight inputs, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So here's the big question. I only got one pin here of one interface. I got eight here. How do I make that happen? Now, you earlier said something that is the answer to this question. What was it? A splitter, okay? So a splitter is a kind of wire. So we go to a splitter here. And what do you think a splitter does? Splits up the individual pins. <laughs> <laughs> it splits, okay? But what is it splitting? Okay, let's take a look at the properties of a splitter, okay? It says right here, um, it's, it has a bit width of two. We need four. No, we need eight because the output of the ROM is eight bit. And we want it to split into eight individual <coughs> wires because we want to hook up each wire to each pin of the eight, uh, of the seven segment display. Oh, wait, on, hold on a second here. That doesn't make any sense. It's called a seven segment display. How come there are eight <coughs> inputs? It doesn't make any sense. Ground. Can we count from zero to seven? Not the ground. Yeah, go ahead. Count from zero to seven. Mm, no. So okay. Not, not the no. You guys are way too young to remember these things. Or have I seen these things. A seven segment display is called a seven segment display because there are seven segments. That's not circular. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So what do you think the eighth, eighth input is going to specify? Not the ground? No, not the ground. The ground is a whole different playing field. It's it, these are all logical connections because there's no power pin either, okay? So where do you think the eighth bit is specified? Like all the way across? The decimal point. Oh. <laughs> now we have eight. Now don't ask me which one is which one because I never, never remember. Okay, so let's go ahead and make this happen. Let's do this. So the fan out ratio of the split is gonna be eight. So this way I can get all eight individual bits out of the output of this thing. And you can see it's even changing right now as we speak. All right, so now we just have to hook these things up and I want to hook it up in a way that is not interfering. So I think this may be one, two, three. How many people take electronic classes? So I have at least taken one before. I used to work there. Okay. Do you like those classes? It's the area is mostly for telecom. Okay. So if, so you're, if you're into that, then, then that's where you go. Ah. Do they do networking or just uh, yeah, they like phone type of a telecom? Uh, they do networking too. But they also do a lot of soldering. Mm, Seven. Something is not. Well, because I just order. use random it's values, right? <laughs> I just use random values. I just use random values. I just doesn't know what a. Uh, but that's, 
Well, after it goes through a few times, you can probably figure out which pin is which pin. That actually would be a good homework assignment. You know, I'm not, I don't show you the actual connection, but I specify the value, like this hexadecimal digit results in this, you know, in the seven segment display, and I give you a whole bunch of examples, like 16 of those, and you have to deduce which wire controls which segment. You can do that, I mean, if, well, assuming I give you 16 useful samples, right? Because if I give you 16 samples and they're all the same, that may not be very helpful. <laughs> like they're all FFs, and all the segments turned on, it's not gonna be helpful. Okay, so are there any questions about this picture? Okay, the, the, seven, se the seven segment display is only here just for fun, okay? But the concept is we have a mechanism that can increment the counter automatically per clock. We have another mechanism, which is a ROM, a read-only memory, that can store specific patterns, okay? When you turn off the computer, these patterns will not lose, okay? They will still be here, they're not volatile. And then we have the concept of the processor design. So when we get back to the processor design, get rid of the help screen here, then we now have a way, we now have a way to specify the on, off of all of these things. Are we kind of doing, are we doing okay in terms of the concepts, the main concepts of these control pins, the individual components, and which part is actually missing? Okay. Are there any questions? No questions? Right? So if there are no questions, what we'll do is we are going to manually do some calculations. So I'll inject certain values into the registers, and then we'll say, okay, but how do we find the sum of these, of this, of these two numbers, and then store it back into the registers? And if I remember correctly, this is the version of the processor where I still haven't fixed a particular problem. Well, that's nice. And I mm -hmm. am correct. Okay, this is the old version. So let me close this are the changes because they, there should be a newer version of Ludo too. Let's see. There we go. Look at how do I know this is a newer version? Because it's six days newer. Yeah, two, it's six days later. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, if you really want to know, you know, what I did with these things, what do you do? Yes. You get into a TARDIS and travel back in time. It's actually less expensive now, because we got... Come on. Watch the capacitor? <laughs> <laughs> no, we have YouTube. You go to YouTube, you locate the class notes, you know, like either on that day or right before that day. Then you know exactly what I talked about when I, when I came up with this design, okay? Which may be helpful, okay? Because if you watch that a little bit before the class, then you know what I'm gonna talk about and how those things are supposed to relate to each other. Okay, so let's go ahead and open this one because I, I do want to show you like manually how do you do certain operations. So we save the link and we'll just go ahead and save it. Same name, file open, ah, new, I meant go to the temp folder. Okay, this is the new one. There we go. And then you guys go like, but it looks the same. No, it doesn't look the same. See the name of this label is already changed. Okay. So what we want to do is we are going in here and you can also see this is uglier than the previous version because it is the correct one. Okay, so what we want to do, what I want to do is to inject certain values into this re into these registers. This is zero, so this is register zero, one, two. So I'm going to go to register one, change its content to a particular value. Let's say six, seven in hexadecimal. I will change this one to another value. Let's say eight, four in hexadecimal. And I want to compute the sum of these two registers using the ALU and then store the result back into I don't know, the first one, okay, register two. 
That's what I want to do. Are we doing okay so far? I'll write it on the whiteboard so that this way I don't forget. I don't forget what I'm supposed to do. So we want to do a register to equals to gets the result of register to plus what is the other one? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So that's register 5, like so. OK, so this is what I want to do. But I have to do it manually, because that drum inside the music box is missing. So I'm plugging <laughs> those wires manually. Okay. All right, let's see how we can do this. Go back to the main design. All right. This is the ALU. I don't even want to mess around with the ALU until I can specify and until I can tell the register bank that I want register 2 as one of the output and register 5 as the other output. We doing okay so far? And from the naming of these particular pins, which ones should I be changing? These two, right? So let's specify a 1 with this one and the five with the other one. <coughs> Question, how can I check whether it is doing something correct or not? I can click on a wire, okay? When you click on a wire, in simulation mode, it will tell you what is the content on that wire. Okay. And let's see, we have one input here. Hey, that's not that that's not specified actual values. It's saying there's nothing on that particular wire. When you see something like this in simulation, it means nobody is driving that wire, which basically means it's quote unquote floating. In electrical engineering terms, it means it's floating. It means the wire is not connected to power. It's, if no one is driving it high, it is not connected to ground, nobody is driving it low. What it really is is an antenna just receiving you know, random radio signal at this point. What am I missing? Look at the top two pins, okay? There are two pins on the top that might have something to do with this. What are those? The output enables, okay? They're both zeros. Ah, no wonder it's not doing anything because the register bank output enable pins are now not asserted, okay? They're disabled. Okay, maybe that's fine. So let's go ahead and turn on both of those, okay? On and on. Now we check out these pins again and see, oh, okay. Is that what we specified earlier? I don't remember specifying 103. Six, six, and hexadecimal, right? Yep, exactly. It was in hexadecimal when we specify the values in the registers. This is in decimal, okay? In hexadecimal, this is six, seven, which is certainly one of the values. And then the other one, which is this one here, Oh, I certainly did not specify a negative value, but look at the bit pattern. It is 8, 4, which is the other one. So we are good. We are actually good so far. Now I need to go to the ALU and, and focus on the ALU. First of all, I need to remember, is the adder the first one or the second one? I cannot remember. Who is the first one? I think it's the first one, but let's double check. Yep, the adder is the first one. Okay, so if the add is the first one, then what should I use as the select? Zero. Zero, because zero is the first number. Okay, so zero being the ALU selection is good. Okay, no problem. Then I go ahead and check the output, and not surprisingly, it's not working, because I forgot something again. The output enable, okay? So I need to make sure that I click on this output enable of the ALU so that the output of the ALU is actually driving the bus, okay? So let's check whether that math works out or not. We have 8, 4 plus 6, 7 in hexadecimal. 4 plus 7 is 11 in base 10. But in hexadecimal, we have one single digit that can represent 11. What is that? B. And then we have 8 plus 4, which is uh, 14 in decimal. In hexadecimal, it is not D, close E. Yep. E, B should be the result. Oh, but we don't see E, B. Yes, I do. 1110 is E, 1011 is B. 
Okay, how many people have that little table handy? <laughs> ah, I know. So does it match up? E is one 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 zero. Yeah. And B is one zero one one. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So it does work out. Oh, but wait, we are not done yet, because we have to store that back into one of the registers. We want to store it back into register two. Okay, so now we switch, we, we change our focus back to the register bank, and then we say, how do we select which register is responsible to store the result? Register in select, okay? We want to store it back into register two, which means this has to be a zero, one, zero, okay? And what else do you think I have to specify? I keep forgetting the what? The enable. So we have to turn on the enable here. And now the register bank is paying attention to the clock. Okay, before it doesn't really care. It's not paying attention at all. So now we have to clock, have a rising edge and then a falling edge. Okay, the falling edge is not important, but I, I would like to uh, return the clock back to the original state. So we clock, clock. There we go. Okay, now how do we know that the computation has happened? There are two ways you can do it. One is to go into the register bank. The second one is to look at the output of the ALU because the ALU would have changed because it's now using the new value of register to, to specify one of the inputs. But if we just look into the register bank, that should also show us the result of storing the value. And it is, oh, it's not. Why is it not storing it? It's selecting the right one. Oh, this is not, um, that's not, I forgot one thing. Let's, let's, oops. Forgot one thing. Look at the input to the, uh, this is the wrong value. Why is it, why is it wrong? Because there's a mux in between. I forgot to switch the right track with the mux. See this mux here? I want this wire to connect to this wire here, but it's not, it's connecting the other one. Why do you think the mux is connecting the other one? Look at the mux selection. It's, selection, it's selecting zero, which means it's taking the top one. But the top one is connected to what? It's connected to the output. So it's not changing. That's why it's not changing. <coughs> okay, so we have to change the mux to a one so now if we using the correct content, then we clock it again, clock high, clock low, go into the register bank, and register two is now EB. There we go. But you can see how many little steps I have to do just to get two outputs from the register bank, perform an add operation, store the result back into another register, and call it one single instruction. The drum is going to do that, okay? So what we need to do is to specify the bit pattern into the ROM so that we just use the instruction to index into the right portion of the ROM and then just let it roll. Then it will just exercise all of those pins individually, automatically, and it will be ready for the next instruction. So are we doing okay so far with the overall operation of the processor, <laughs> at least in just in the context of using the ALU and the register bank. Is that okay? Now I want to do something fancy. Now that I have the sum, I want to store the sum into a particular uh, location in memory. Okay? So let's see how we can do that. Go back to the main, the main design here. I'm going to turn off all of the output and enable because until they, they are needed, you know, I would rather not be driving the bus. Okay, so we want to take register two and store it to a certain location. And let's just say the location I want to store to is already in this address register. We'll just call it location 2F. Okay, there we go. All right, how do we make this happen? We want to store register 2, the content of register 2 
to location 2F in the RAM module. How do we do this? Well, first of all, we look, yeah, go ahead. Uh, we specify the, the address of the pages. Yep. So we want this wire to connect to the address line of the RAM. That's the first thing we want to do, right? So we want this wire to connect to this one, but it's going through a MUX, which means I need to know what value I need to specify here to select this one over here. One is not the correct answer. This is zero, this is one, this is two, okay? So I need to select one, zero. I can double check. This is now two F, so we're good. So now we have selected the right location in memory. This is going to be a right operation from the memory's perspective. So what should I use for the load for the LD pin? It's okay if you don't remember, because I don't remember either. So we just hover the mouse pointer over that. It says load, if one, load memory to output, which means we want it to be a zero, okay? So we change the load pin from a, oh, it's already a zero, so that's good. Okay, we are ready to go. Clear is definitely zero because we, we don't want to reset the content of memory all the time. Uh, RAM select, it is not selected. It's not paying any attention at all. So we want to turn, off, turn it on for the one here. And what is now missing is the data bus is not driven. When you see XXXX you know, on a particular bus, it means nobody is driving. It's, it's basically not driven. So now we want to connect this bus to one of the outputs of the register bank. It's already connected, but why is there nothing there? Because output enable is not on. And I have not even selected the right register yet. Well, actually, you know, from the previous time, you know, I already had a leftover of 010 to register zero output, so that's actually okay. But I have not enabled it. So it's time to enable that particular register. So we just go here and say, yes, go ahead and drive it. And we can double check and make sure that it is driven and it is, um, that's, is that the right <coughs> value? Yes, it is, the, it, it, it is the right value, it's EB. So the content of register two is now presented on the data bus. The data bus is connected to the RAM. So let's go to the RAM module and find out what it is doing. Ah, it has gone to the right location because 2C is the leftmost byte on this row. So we have 2C, 2D, 2E, this is 2F. It is addressing the right location, but it's still 0, 0. But even though the bus is specifying the right content, how come it has not updated yet? We're missing that exactly the clock, okay? Can someone tell me where the clock connects to? The entire system has one single clock. It's the very same clock that we used earlier to clock in the register. So if you look at this, this clock here, just follow this line, turns around, goes back here, goes all the way up, and it connects all the way back to here. This is the system clock. So we say clock high, and go back and check the memory. It is now updated to EV. Now, of course, every, every clock has to go back to zero. So that completes the sequence of executing two instructions. Add register two and register five, store the result back into register two, one instruction. And then store the result, or store the value of register two to the location pointed to by the address register is the second instruction. And how many times have I clicked on the screen? Many, many times, okay? So you can kind of expect, you know, how many wires this particular, this drum has to click. Because you can tell by the number of pins or the number of bits of these pins that when you add, that when you add those numbers up, that's kind of the width of the, uh, the raw module to specify what we call the microcode. Are we still doing okay so far with the overall concept of a processor design? That's okay? So 
I know you guys still have a homework assignment. You still have the uh, subtractor as a homework assignment, and I know that one is really kind of tedious. It might take you a little bit of time, but this might give you an idea of how to test it. How would this help you test your design? <coughs> Let me go back to this guy here. You go to the register, and you say, well, I want to specify six bit here. And the, you probably won't need this, so we'll get rid of all of this stuff here because you won't need those. Get rid of those. You will still need this, just change that to six bit. All right, so now you have a basic engine we, we still have one more incompatibility thing. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and change this. All right. So now you have a basic engine to test your design. You need a splitter, okay? Okay, I'll do that part for you. So go to pan, oh no, go to um, splitter. Go to splitter, hook it up to here. Specify six bits, and you want to fan out to exactly six, just like that. Okay, now we have a basic design to test your subtractor. How would you hook up these things to test your subtractor? Exactly. So the six pins, three goes to x, three goes to y, and then then what do you do? Then you can exercise all of your gates. But how do you know whether the output of your gates is correct or not? How do you, what do you compare against? There's nothing to compare against just yet. So what you do is you go to arithmetic. You pick out a subtractor. You make it a three-bit subtractor. Like that. You probably want to, even though it's not required, but it's just you know, a good idea to do this, specify a zero go to the, in, the borrow input, okay, because you don't have any actual borrow from the least significant digit, uh, of the least significant digit. So what you do is ho you hook up three wires into the first port of the subtractor, hook up the other three pins to the other port of the subtractor, and then this, this output will be the actual correct output. Is that okay? So now you have the correct output using a, you know, implemented subtractor have the output of your own subtractor, how do you compare whether they are correct or not, whether it's correct or not? You can do several things, okay? One thing you can do is to use exclusive OR. Because exclusive OR is a one only if the two input pins are different. If you negate that, it tells you whether they are the same or not. And then you, so you have um, four of those things, to confirm whether each pin is giving you the correct result or not. You take those four pins, and you hook up all of those to a OR, a four input OR gate. The output of the OR gate will now tell you, oh, is everything correct, or is there at least one pin that is incorrect? Something along that line. You have to figure out the polarity. But if the zero or one of that pin is gonna tell you whether it's right or not. And then the next thing you do is to change the clock frequency because this will take 128 seconds to finish everything. And you, don't, you probably, you know, since you're automating stuff, you don't want to wait 128 seconds. So you go to simulate and you say, hey, I can take a lot faster now. Four kilohertz, bleed, get out. And then it will crank out all this stuff. And then you'll say, but I have no idea what I just saw. I saw that pin turning on, it blinks once, but I don't know which case it blinked on. So what do you do? Save it to memory. Or well, to the make it room. You enable something that is really cool in Logic Sim. You go to log you go to simulate, you go to logging. So when you go to logging, you can now you know specify what you are logging. So you can say you can log the register. You can log, uh, basically, if you have pins, you can log the pins. And to have pins is easy, okay? What you need to do is just to specify a pin, especially output pin, 
Okay, so what you do is you, you look at whatever you want to log, you hook up an output pin to it. So let's say I want to uh, log a pin bit zero of this thing here. You just hook it up. Now, when you go to simulate logging, the pin appears as one of the options. You just say add and specify the, the output file. Select as output, click save, and it is automatically enabled. And obviously, this is not going to do anything that's particularly interesting. So when you're all done, you just click disable, and then you go back to the file to find out you know, what is the content of that file. That will give you the um, it will give you <coughs> the columns. So we can tell the columns are the register is the first six bits. It's it does a split because of the it, it only wants it wants to organize four bits in one chunk. And then the one column all the way to the right hand side, that's for the um, output pin. So now you just have to go through this log here. Go to the column where it indicates whether some, whether your output is correct or not. Find out which row is wrong. Then you can go back to the test case. Are we doing okay so far with this? You don't have to do this. I'm just thinking that you know if you are doing the subtractor and you are wondering whether it is right or not, and you have been thinking about okay, you know, how do I check all possible cases? And you want to use your know, logic sim to test out all the things that we did today. This is a great way to integrate the music box mechanism and turn it into something that can help you debug and test the subtractor. As if the subtractor doesn't have enough wires and components already. <laughs> Are there any questions? No questions? Right. So if there are no questions, I'm going to end the lecture. Oh, in fact, we are seven minutes past the, the time to end the lecture. But I won't ask for donations.